All right. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is one of my favorite sub subjects, rehabbing. And I like to rehab for big profits. Tim and AC talked to you earlier about the average um, profit you make on a wholesale deal, right? They're averaging about $9,700 profit per deal, you know, right at 10 grand. Sometimes they make 5,000, sometimes they make 1,000, sometimes they make 30,000, um, sometimes they make a lot more. But on average, it works out to about $9,700 for, for us at Prosperity. Other wholesalers might not do as well, others may do better. Okay, um, nobody in town does the volume we do. We do more wholesale deals than anybody else in town. More numbers, more volume. Okay, on the other hand, rehabbing on average, depending upon the price point of the rehab itself, the after repaired value, rehabbing makes anywhere from 15 to fifteen to fifty thousand dollars on average. You're going to see my average for some homes that uh, that I've done recently, and then you're going to see some numbers for some homes that I'm moving into now toward the end of this presentation. So, why rehabbing? Again, I'll ask you to hold your questions till the end. And then if we have as much time as we did on the last one to answer, um, if not, I'll be in the, in the back. Um, okay. Rehabbing or retail sales is when you purchase a property and you make all the necessary repairs to bring that property up to market standards and sell it at a retail price. Rehabbing is flipping properties. Y'all have seen the whole the shows on on uh, TV, flipping Las Vegas, flipping Boston. Uh, it doesn't happen quite the way they show it on TV. Not nearly as much drama, um, but uh, that's basically what we're talking about here. We're talking about flipping homes, okay? And here's an example of a standard flip. This is a hypothetical. You have an after repaired value or an ARV, A -R -V, an after repaired value of $100,000. You get that house under contract for $60,000. You're going to spend $10,000 in fixing it up. That's a fairly light rehab and you sell it for close to $100,000. So you're into it for $70,000, you make a profit of $30,000. That's a standard example of a normal flip. Okay? All right, why rehab and retail? Well, AC and Tim touched on it earlier. More profit. There's more profit per deal on a rehab than there is on a wholesale deal. <laughs> Therefore, I can make the same amount of money doing fewer deals. And I love what I do. I love rehabbing. I'm providing quality housing at a fair price, and I get the biggest kick out of taking a piece of junk and turning it into a jewel. Okay. Here's the process. It's pretty simple. The first thing you got, you got to do is find the deal. And we'll talk about some ways to find, find deals. You got to get it under contract. You've got to fund it. You've got to fix it. And then you got to flip it. Pretty straightforward. 
We're going to talk about each one of those categories here for, for a minute. Okay, finding the deal. I happen to know 43 ways to locate motivated sellers. Our prosperity uh, students learn most of those ways as well. I don't have any trouble finding motivated sellers. Okay, now, I used to do like Tim and AC do. Um, I used to send out direct mail pieces. I used to I used to I used to find the motivated sellers myself. I started out just like AC as a sole practitioner, a, a sole proprietor, a one man show, if you will. Now, my business is set up to do where I do one thing and one thing only. Everything else, including finding motivated sellers, I now outsource or delegate. I do one thing and one thing only in my business, and that's raise the money. Everything else I've got outsourced, and I am the laziest guy on the planet. I am so lazy, uh, you wouldn't believe it. Talk about a lifestyle. It's really nice to get up every day and know that all I got to do is go look for some money, and it is so easy to do. We're going to talk tomorrow. I'm going to show you how how I raised seven million dollars without even without even breaking a sweat. Let me give you a little preview of what you're going to learn tomorrow. We're going to we're going to show you how to how to get a million dollars in funding for your deals. A million dollars. There you go. There you go. Good for you. Give yourself 500 points. Okay, here's the deal. There is 17 trillion, that's trillion with a T, 17 trillion dollars out there looking for a place to go. It is so easy to find money, folks. Anybody that says, I can't do real estate because I'm broke, I don't have any money. And you don't need money to do real estate, I promise you. Okay, so I know 43 ways to find motivated sellers. Now, I use predominantly wholesalers and realtors to bring me deals. People tell me there's no, there's no good deals on the MLS anymore. Has anybody heard that? You can't find a good deal on the MLS? Of my last five deals, two of them came off the MLS. Straight off the MLS. Two out of the last five came off the MLS. Don't tell me there's no deals on the MLS. Uh, online classified ads is another excellent way to find deals. AC touched on that earlier today. Craigslist, um, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, uh, YouTube. There's all kinds of all kinds of opportunities to find online classifieds. Um, there's a guy right here in town, uh, I think Cynthia mentioned yesterday, um, myhousedeals.com. Who all's familiar with myhousedeals.com? Whoa, wow, a lot of y'all know that, that website. Well, that's a friend of mine, Doug Smith. I knew Doug before, I knew Doug before he bought his first piece of real estate. Doug used to come and uh, uh, set up chairs for me when I was teaching landlording back in a prior lifetime. Uh, Tim I've known since he, since he first got started. Tim didn't own any real estate when I met him. Tim, Tim was just getting started in the business. And uh, Tim is a real success story. Okay, uh, so online classified ads like myhousedeals.com, there's a number of websites out there that provide that service. Paid marketing. Um, you know, Tim and AC do a lot of direct mail. Direct mail works beautifully. It's a great source of, um, of finding um, motivated sellers. Um, when I was actively pursuing my own deals, I used bandit signs a lot. Bandit signs were my most productive method for finding junker deals. 
and expired listings on the MLS was my most prolific method of finding uh, pretty house deals, what are called pretty house deals. Um, okay. So, finding deals is not hard. I mean, there's lots of deals out there. Next thing you got to do is you got to contract it. Contracting is pretty straightforward. You've got to contact the seller. You've got to inspect the property so you know what you're dealing with. You've got to get a repair estimate. Now, George touched on repair estimates previously. From a wholesaler's perspective, um, you don't need to be very explicit in your repair estimates. You have to be accurate, but not explicit. You don't have to you don't have to pr produce a big list of everything that's going to be done, but if you're going to rehab, you might want to be a little bit more detailed, detail oriented. Uh, as George mentioned earlier, I've got a list that I use um, to determine what repairs need to be done. We also teach at Prosperity Group, we teach your 4M method to quickly analyze uh, or quickly estimate repairs uh, fairly accurately without being nearly as explicit in the detail. Okay, then you've got to negotiate and, and agree on a price. Okay. Will mentioned uh, yesterday, in this life, life is not fair, and in this life, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Life is not fair, and you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Okay? So, negotiation is a critical part of this process. Being able to negotiate well and get the best price possible is critical to your success. Open title, and that's about all it, that's about all it takes to contract a deal. Contact the seller, inspect the property, get repair estimates, negotiate and agree on a price, and open title. Pretty straightforward stuff. Okay, the next thing you have to do is fund it. Now, like I said earlier, there's more money than you can shake a stick at. $17 trillion. Uh, for, do you guys know what a trillion is, by the way? No, no, no. How many I don't know how many zeros, but let, let, let me put it into perspective for you. You ready for this? I'm going to put it into perspective for you. I know what a million is because I've made a million. I don't know what a billion is yet. But I know what a million is. If you spent one dollar every second that you took breath, every second that you took breath, if you spent a dollar, you would spend sixty dollars in a minute, right? You spend three thousand six hundred dollars in an hour, and you'd spend eighty six thousand four hundred dollars in a day. It'd take you about twelve days to spend a million bucks, spending a dollar a second. Okay, that's a million. A billion is going to take you almost 32 years. That's the difference between a million and a billion. 12 days and 32 years. That's the difference between a million and a billion. Now, you ready for a trillion? 31,710 years. 31,710 years. Something like that. How long is recorded history? I mean, 31,710 years to spend a trillion dollars. Now, our government can spend a trillion dollars overnight. You know. Okay, so that put it into perspective for me. When I saw that, I realized what a trillion is, and there is seventeen trillion dollars looking for a place to go. Seventeen trillion dollars 
looking for me to provide a deal for them to put their money into. Don't tell me finding money is hard. Finding money is easy. Okay? All right. So to fund the deal, you can fund it with your own money. That's what I did with my first deal. I bought my first deal in 1974. <clears throat> um, I've been at this 40 years. I'm a slow learner. I've only done 443 transactions. It's taken me 40 years to do that. It took me like 10 years to do 10 deals um, because I, I really didn't see the vision when I bought my first deal. I thought, hey, this is pretty slick. I bought a, I bought a chunk of dirt. I bought 40 acres, split it into four 10-acre parcels, sold, sold those parcels off, and sold them with owner financing. I carried the paper. I became the bank. I said, wow, this is a great way to make money. I got hooked. But I, but I wasn't very aggressive. So I used my, my personal money for my first few deals. Well, the problem is it's a limited amount of money. In fact, when I started, it was a very limited amount of money. Um, so I started going to the banks and using bank money, mortgage money, mortgage company money. And that's a great resource. I still use banks today, but I use banks a little differently. Now I, I use them for take, what's called takeout money. Anyway, that's another story. But um, banks and mortgage companies, they will let you go so far and then they'll say, sorry, you've got too many loans. We're not going to loan you any more money. Wait a minute. I'm paying all these loans. I've got good cash flow. You know, why won't you loan me anymore? It's our policy. Okay. So I went to the next source of money, which is hard money. <clears throat> now, those of you that were here during lunch yesterday, um, I, I wasn't in the room, but I understand Blake Yarbrough came over and talked to you about hard money, didn't he? Hard money is a great source of funding. There's a number of hard money lenders here in the Houston area. Um, and then private money. Private money is, oh man, I love private money. I am a private money fool. Um, I love private money because typically it's less expensive than hard money. Okay, so there's plenty of ways you can fund deals. Private money is, well, first of all, let me talk about hard money. Hard money is Blake Yarbrough, Jet Lending, uh, ISB, um, Red Door, uh, Noble Mortgage, Surrender. You, 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 you do hard money lending? Hard money or private money? Okay. Okay, hard money is is when it's a company set up to loan money and that's what they do for a living. That's that's how they that's how they make money is by loaning their money out. Private money on the other hand is an individual. Somebody like me, I'm a private money lender, I'm a private money borrower and a private money lender. Somebody like me who makes you a loan and I'm just an individual. I'm I'm not an I don't that's not my main source of income. It's not a company. It's a private individual making a private loan to, to another individual. Okay, that's the main difference between private money and hard money. Okay, so there's lots of ways to fund your deals. Yes, sir. Are the hard and private money lenders, is there a certain cap? You mean the dollar amount of the of the of the value of the property? The money that they will lend as far as the dollar amount or the interest rate? Dollar, dollar amount. Yes. Every, every hard money lender will have his cap and every private money lender will have his cap. Everybody's different. Every hard money lender is different. Every private money lender is different. How about interest is about charge? Is there a range? Yes. You, in Texas... You can charge no more than 18% interest for a real estate loan. Now, 
Has anybody ever heard of a hard money company who charged more than 80%? How did they do it? I'll tell you how they did it. Points. But the points went to a different company. If the points go to the same company, it's, it's included in the 18%. If they go to a different company, they can do it differently. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. We are now getting into topics that are way off base. We're going to, we're going to talk about private money and hard money tomorrow. If, if it's okay with you, can we defer that till tomorrow? And if it doesn't get, if your question doesn't get answered tomorrow, I want you to see me privately because I'll answer it. I promise you. I want you, when you guys leave out of here tomorrow evening, I want you to have every question. You have every question that came up during the course of this weekend. I want you to have an answer before you leave the building. And if, if I can't answer it, I promise you, there's guys in our organization that can answer all those questions. We don't want you going out of here confused or not knowing um, or, or not knowing the answer to something or with a question on your mind. We want you going out of here ready to hit it Monday morning. In fact, tomorrow, one of the things I'm going to do is give you some uh, a 30-day game plan so that Monday morning you can go to work. Okay, so we talked about finding it. Uh, we talked about funding it. We talked about finding it, co contracting it, funding it. Now we need to fix it. All right. There's several ways you can fix properties. Somebody is going to have to swing a hammer and swing paint. Now, I don't do that. In fact, there's a state law in Texas that says Jim Kennedy is specifically prohibited from swinging hammers and swinging paint. When I swing a hammer, the nail I hit is normally the one on my, the end of my thumb. Okay? When I, when I swing, uh, sling paint, I normally get more on me than I get on the wall. So I don't sling ham, swing hammers and sling paint. It's just not what I do. Okay? All right. So, but there are people who have those skills, have that skill set, and they might want to DIY, do it yourself. Okay? Now, if you are a contractor, if you're in the business of being a contractor and you want to do a rehab, you might want to do it yourself. I will tell you this most of the guys that I know that are contractors very quickly realize that they can make a whole lot more money doing deals than they can swinging hammers and slinging paint. It is not an efficient use of your time. Now, a buddy of mine, very knowledgeable, prolific real estate entrepreneur, uh, started doing it this way, DSOYI. Uh, do some of it yourself. He was comfortable doing some of the stuff he could swing a hammer, he could sling paint, he could lay tile, he didn't fix roofs, uh, he didn't fix AC units, he didn't do electrical, he didn't do plumbing, but he could do some of the basic stuff, and that's how he started his rehabbing business, doing some of it himself. Or you can act as your own general contractor. Now, when I got in the business, I had no skills in these first two areas. None. Zip, zilch. So, I started here. I started acting as my own general contractor. That means I had to arrange the foundation guy. I had to arrange the electrician, the plumber, the, um, the painter, the, uh, the, uh, the roofer. I had to coordinate all this. I had to make sure that the foundation guy got in first, followed by the roofer. I had to make sure that the painter uh, got in before the carpet got laid. I had to make sure that the plumber wasn't button heads with the electrician. That was my job, was to coordinate all that stuff. Now I pick up the phone and I say, Mr. Contractor, I've got three or four that I work with. Mr. Contractor, I need a bid on 123 Main Street. How fast can you get me the bid? That's the extent of my contracting business now. I let them do it all. Now, I pay more money 
to have that done, but it's more efficient for me to do that, to hire a general contractor. It's more efficient for me to do that and spend my time doing deals. I, like, I make a lot more money doing deals than I do acting as a general contractor. Okay, so fixing it, hopefully if you want to get in the rehab game, hopefully you'll come to a point where you realize that uh, uh, it's more efficient to hire it done than to do it yourself. Okay, finding good contractors. Well, the very best source is referrals from other rehabbers, experienced guys, people, guys and gals, experienced rehabbers who are actively doing deals, hiring contractors, and uh, that's the best source that I can think of to, uh, to find good contractors. Four things you've got to expect of your contractor. Number one, sure. Finding good contractors, the absolute very best source is other rehabbers. Got it? Okay. Four things to expect from your contractor. Obviously, you want good workmanship. That's paramount. You don't want that. You don't want to hire a guy who comes in and does slipshod work. It's got to be completed in a timely manner. Time is money in real estate. So, when that contractor starts working, I want him on the job at least six days a week. I want him uh, checking in. Um, with his crew, I want I want crews there six days a week, and I want the contractor checking on those crews, and I want I want the work to progress in a timely manner. Okay, price that fits the budget. This is critical. You've got to have a contractor that can deliver investor pricing. You can't go out and hire church services or ARS or uh, any of the big contractors that that uh, supply the retail market because you just can't afford them. It won't fit an investor uh, pro forma. And fourth, they've got to stand behind their work. Uh, all of my contractors comply with all four of these standards. And if they don't, I don't hire them again. If they do a bad job, they're never going to work for me again anyway. What I'm talking about is if, if, if my audience, my, my customer is a retail buyer, an owner-occupant retail buyer, so when I do a rehab, I'm selling to somebody who's going to move into the house. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to have the property inspected by a licensed inspector, and that licensed inspector is going to find some things wrong. My contractor is going to go back and stand behind his work at no cost to me. And my contractors will even throw in little stuff that wasn't on our original scope of work. They'll throw in the little stuff and only charge me for the stuff that the inspector finds that wasn't in the original scope of work. You're not selling a brand new home and nothing is perfect. So the inspectors are going to find some stuff wrong. That's all I mean is that the contractor's got to stand behind his work. Okay. Yes, sir. How often do you negotiate the contract? Every time. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, how often do I negotiate the, uh, the cost of the repairs? Every time. I have contractors that know what I will pay, and they know uh, what it takes to do a reasonable job at a reasonable price. They've got to make money. I don't begrudge anybody uh, an income. I just don't want them to get rich off of one of my deals. Okay? Um, so uh, I negotiate every time. I might not try and beat a contractor up, but I'm going to get three bids, and 
the contractors know that they're competing with other contractors. Okay. Um, I think AC mentioned this earlier. Begin the repairs immediately because time is money. Yes, sir. Do you negotiate a timeline with your contractor? His question is, do I negotiate a timeline with my contractors? Yes, I do. And I will ask a contractor, how long is it going to take to do this job? Now, some of the jobs that you're going to see uh, took three, three weeks, four weeks. Some of the jobs now are taking six months. Um, if the job took three weeks, uh, I tell them I'll give you four. But one day over the over the over the fourth over the twenty on the 29th day, you're going to start paying a penalty for every day you're late. Now, how do I figure the penalty? I take the cost of my money because I use almost exclusively private money to fund these deals. I take the cost of my money figure out what it costs me every day to uh, to pay for that money. And and a little bit more than that is going to be what my contractor's penalty is going to be. Okay. So as an example, I did a deal recently up in Dallas. Uh, it was a $465,000 loan. I bought the property for, uh, for $310,000. Um, well, I'll talk about the numbers in a minute. Anyway, it was $465,000 loan, and um, uh, and the the daily cost of that was was pricey because it was at 13%. It's hard money, by the way, up in Dallas. For some of you, it's hard money in 10 years. We'll talk about that deal specifically. Okay. All right. You got. They've got to do quality work. We talked about that previously. Don't cut corners. These, these are these are the same points that uh, uh, that uh, AC made earlier. And watch your budget and deadlines. Okay. Here's the top five features that are important to today's buyers. Now this comes to uh, it comes to me from a, a survey from Trulia. Dot com that was conducted a couple of years ago, but I can't imagine much has changed in the last two years. Here's the five top features that are important to today's buyers. A master bathroom with spa features. That means they want the whirlpool tub and um, you know dual sinks and and uh, they want it nice. Number two is a walk-in master closet with built-in shelves, built-in drawers, uh, built-in shoe racks. Next is a gourmet kitchen, and, they, and right now the open design is very, very prevalent. If you go into new homes, new homes tell you what buyers want. You want to see what buyers want? Go look at a couple of new home, new home subdivisions. Go, go uh, preview their houses, and the open design is very prevalent very prevalent right now. Almost every rehab I'm doing right now, I'm opening up the floor plan. Almost every rehab. Covered outdoor decks. Oh, you can't see it, but it's hardwood floors is the last. Number five is hardwood floors. Okay, then you've got to flip it. Now, AC and Tim talked about flipping uh, wholesale deals. It's not that not that different from uh, from flipping uh, retail deals, be they uh, residential or commercial. You can fizzbo it. You can act as a for sale by owner. You can hire flat fee realtors. I do this a lot. I get an exposed to the MLS but I don't want to pay a full 6% commission. So I'll hire a flat fee realtor for anywhere from $99 to $1,500, depending upon the bundle of services I'm going to get, get and expect from that realtor. You can hire full service realtors. Uh, I have done so in the past. 
open houses and, and, and showings. Uh, Tim teaches a way to sell houses in seven days or less. Uh, it's something he learned from somebody else, and he's very good at it. Tim, Tim does an exceptional job of selling rehabs in seven days or less. You take offers and agree on a price, and you close and get paid. That's the best part, the getting paid. Now, as George, AC, Tim, Will all mentioned previously, wholesaling is relatively fast and quick. Rehabbing is not. Rehabbing takes a little longer. Uh, you have significantly more risk in rehabbing than you do in wholesaling, but the paydays are better. You're going to see some examples here in a minute. Okay, so here's the kind of money that can be made with um, with flips. I'm gonna I'm gonna run through some flips that I've done. The flips on this uh, on this on this screen are gonna be stuff that uh, I completed over a, about a two year period of time, from beginning to end. Uh, Old Village Lane, I made about twenty thousand dollars profit on that deal. Barracuda Lane down in Laporte, I made $23,000 profit on that deal. Uh, William Morton out in um, uh, Pecan Grove out by Richmond, I made $20,500 on that one. Marlin Lane. Uh, Marlin Lane was in the same subdivision as Barracuda Lane in Laporte. Uh, anybody familiar with Laporte? Laporte's an interesting city. There is a subdivision. There is a, 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 a subdivision. It's called Bay Colony. It is totally separate from the rest of the city of Laporte. It, it, it does, it's not connected with Laporte at all. It's separated from Laporte by a little uh, municipality called Shore Acres. Don't ever do a rehab in Shore Acres. I've never done one, but I've talked to some guys that have had horror stories down there. Well, this little subdivision called Bay Colony is completely separate from the rest of Laporte. And all the streets, it's a small little subdivision. All, oops. All the streets have, uh, are named after uh, fish. Marlin Lane, Barracuda Lane, Tarpon Lane, Sailfish Lane, Swordfish Lane, all these different fish names. And it's a small subdivision. There's maybe 10 or 12 streets. So I'm doing this rehab over on Barracuda Lane. That's a nice little rehab. Um, and uh, the house had been damaged by Hurricane Ike. Um, I went in, got a good deal on it, fixed it up, bought it from a wholesaler, fixed it up. And while I'm fixing it up, um, I contacted the president of the Property Owners Association down there, the HOA. And uh, I said, I introduced myself. I said, hi, my name's Jim. Uh, I noticed you've got this nice little um, community area there. It was a, it had a boat ramp, it had a dock, it had uh, a, a, a fishing pier, it had a swimming pool, it had a gym set for the kids, a picnic area for the families. A uh, nice little uh, uh, community area, uh, but it was locked up. And I said, how do you get access? So I called the, the president of this property owners association. And, and I explained who I am, what I'm doing, and why I'm calling. I'm not going to move into this house. I'm going to sell it. But I want to be able to tell my buyer, uh, whoever buys this property on Barracuda Lane, I want to be able to tell them about the features of the community. So we have a nice little conversation. A couple weeks later, I get a call from Bill, Bill Stecker. And Bill has got a house over on Marlin Lane. Same shape as Barracuda, uh, damaged by Hurricane Ike. Now, Bill lives across the street. And the owners of Marlin Lane got their insurance settlement 
and they they were they were one of the families that said, "That's it. We're done. We're moving out of the hurricane, the path of hurricanes. We've had it." So they sold the house to Bill, who lived across the street. Now Bill was a trucker, and he thought he watched flipping Las Vegas or flipping Boston or whatever. He said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna do that." And I'm going to have me a little rent house when I'm all said and when it's all said and done. He had no idea what he was sinking his teeth into. He bit off way more than he could chew. So he got the demo done. He got the demolition phase done. Got all the sheetrock off the walls. Got all the insulation out. Um, this house had no foundation damage. Uh, it was slab on grade. The roof was still tight. No damage to the roof. It was just flood damage inside. So he got all the sheetrock off, all the insulation out, all the carpet pulled up, everything done. Got all the cabinets pulled out of the kitchen, except the upper cabinets. He left them. I don't know why. Uh, I guess he was going to try and match the lower cabinets to the upper cabinets. I don't know. Anyway, um, and he had all the trash hauled off. So I didn't have to go, I didn't have to budget a, de a demolition. So I went and I bought the house from, uh, from Bill. Because he, he really, once he got started, he realized it was a lot more work than he thought it was going to be. Okay. So I made about 21000 on, on on that deal. Nice little hit. All right. Oh, that doesn't count the $40,000 I made. I got to tell you about this. <clears throat> this is a hoop. That subdivision sits right across, right next to the Bayport Container Facility. Now, the Bayport Container Facility is where they bring in these these um, ocean liners. I'm sure you've seen them on TV or in the movies, where they're stacked up ten or twenty stories high of. Um, Containers, containers, freight containers. Freight containers. And they, the ships come in, they come into this facility, and then they've got these monster cranes, these cranes that are like 10 or 12 stories high, that go and pick, the, pick the, the containers up off the ship and put them on flatbed trucks and flatbed rail cars. And then they go off to wherever they're going. And they do the same thing in reverse. When we are shipping stuff overseas or wherever, we bring containers into the Bayport Container Facility on flatbed trucks and flatbed rail cars. And they take those same cranes and take them off the trucks and trains and put them on the ships. Well, the Bayport Container Facility is, is, is run by the Port of Houston Authority. So I'm in the middle of this rehab. Actually, I had sold the house. I had done the rehab and sold the house. Marlin Lane. And the buyer, the first buyer, backed out. Because the wife said she didn't want to live that close to the Bayport Container Facility. She had heard that they were going to be doing an expansion, and she didn't want to have to deal with that. So they backed out. I put the house back on the market, and then I get a letter from the Port of Houston Authority, and it says, we want to give you $40,000. Okay. <laughs> Why? Here's the deal. They had done a study, and they're going to expand the Port of Houston, I mean, the, the Bayport Container Facility, and they had done a study, and they had determined how many houses were impacted by the, uh, this addition, this expansion program. And if you owned a property and it had a house on it, they, they were willing to bribe you to the tune of $40,000 if, if you would give them an easement. Now, an easement is nothing more than a right to cross your land or a right to impact your land. And I gave them an easement, 
for light, sound, and vibration. George, when you, when you get a minute. Uh, so they gave me, they, uh, they asked me to sign an easement that says, I will not sue them if they cause consternation with light, sound, and vibration. It took me about mm, two seconds to decide, yes, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yes, I'll take your 40 grand. Now, here's the issue. That easement is going to run with the land. That means that easement is going to stay attached to that property in perpetuity until it is removed by the Port of Houston Authority or some legal way to get it removed or whatever. But that easement's going to run with the land. It's going to stay attached to that house. So my decision was, how much is, is it going to affect the marketability of this house? It already cost me one buyer, not the easement, but the Port of Houston Authority already cost me one buyer. So how much am I going to have to drop the price in order to get the next buyer to buy this house? And is it going to be, am, is it going to be better for me to take the 40 grand, give them the easement, or should I refuse it? Well, it took me two seconds to decide, yes, I'm going to take the 40 grand. Put the house back on the market. I did drop the price $5,000. So it cost me $5,000 uh, and I made $40,000. So my profit was $35,000. That's not included in the 21,000, by the way. That was freebie. I wish I'd owned five houses in that subdivision, or the whole damn subdivision, as a matter of fact. Okay, next house is Meadow Lane. Uh, this was down in uh, Lamarck, Texas. Uh, East Lake is uh, down around uh, um, Edgebrook area, 45 and 610 uh, area. Uh, $39,000 profit on that puppy. Uh, Bighorn Drive. Bighorn Drive is an interesting one. Um, I'll talk about Bighorn when um, when I talk about private money tomorrow, because I, I I pitched a house, a private money deal to a a private money lender, and he didn't like the house I pitched to him because it's one of these next ones that you're going to see, and so I moved him over to Bighorn, uh, and. Uh, uh, he was happy with that. I made $34,000 on, on that house. Oops. Get the right clicker here. Uh, Sage Canyon down in the Sage, Sage Mont area. Uh, again, 45 and 610 area. 37,000. I'm sorry? Did you? I got it. <laughs> Sorry. Somebody got it. Yeah. This is a nice house. Uh, Shear Court, 31,000, 37,000 on, on uh, Sage Canyon, 31,000 on Shear Court. So you can see the numbers are a little bit higher than, than, than the average wholesale flip. Here's one Pines Place that's up in Atascacita. Uh, actually, Humble, um, Fairbrook Lane, that's uh, out in Laporte again, um, Squirrel Tree, Capri Lane, that was, uh, that was in Seabrook, and Ballswell Drive up in Tomball. I'll do deals anywhere from, from Tomball on the northeast. Northwest, Tomball on the northwest, Kingwood on the northeast, Clear Lake on the southeast, Richmond, Texas on the southwest, and anywhere in between. Um, so I cover a pretty wide geographic area. All of my multifamily projects are in that same, that same area as well. Okay, so you add all those profits up together and it comes up to a total of 441000 This is over a two-year period of time. So I averaged $29,400 per deal. 
not a bad way to make a living. Okay. All right. I want to talk about some specific deals, some that we haven't talked about before. Because now I'm doing, yes, sir. After your profit was made, you subtract the hard money then? No, that was in there. That was in there? Yeah. That was in there. The profit was, was that was net profit to me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Probably 80%, maybe 90%. Oh, the question was how many, what percentage of that list do I think came from wholesalers, wholesale deals? And probably 80% of my, I, I buy most of my homes, most of my projects from wholesalers or through realtors, because like I said before, I, I now have my business down to the point where I do one thing and one thing only, and that's raise money. Everything else I either outsource, have employees, virtual assistants, or partners to deal with. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to show you a couple of the direction I'm moving now. I'm moving into a little bit more expensive homes. Why? More money. You got it. He said it. Give yourself five, 500 points. No, 500 points. He said it. More money. It's... Uh, here's a deal I did in Westbury, okay? Anybody know Chimney Rock? Yeah. Chimney Rock's a fairly well-traveled road. I mean, that's, not a, that's not a side street. That was one of the downsides of this proper project was it was on a major thoroughfare. I had to take that into consideration when I bought the thing. I had to know going in that there was still enough profit, even though I know I'm going to take a hit because it's on a, on a major traffic pattern, a major traffic area. I had to know I was going to still make a decent profit. So I bought this place for $78,000. Needed a fair amount of work. I put $75,000 into a rehab. I opened up the floor plan, redesigned the, redesigned the, uh, uh, the interior of the house. Had to do it with permits because we changed some structural law, uh, load-bearing walls. And uh, but the house came out really, really nice. I put seventy-five thousand into into rehabbing it. it. Cost me thirty thousand dollars above and beyond the rehab. The seventy-five thousand went to my contractors. The thirty thousand went to my uh, lender, my uh, holding costs, that sort of thing. Um, the realtors on the back end, all that. So I was all in for 183,000. Sold it for 275. My profit was 92,000. That's why I'm doing the kind of deals I'm doing now. Yeah, it's a it's very hot area. Westbury is very hot. I'd love to do three more deals down there. I'm sorry. It needed 75,000 dollars worth of work. It was his question was how bad was it? Um, it needed $75,000 worth of work. But remember that $75,000 also accomplished um, moving walls, open, opening it up, making an open, uh, open floor plan. Well, there was no, no issue with plumbing. Yeah, uh, I didn't have any problem with the plumbing on this one. Now, I have had plumbing issues, but not on this one. This one was easy. Um, that did include a new roof, though. Okay, here's the deal. Hugo, does that look familiar? I haven't modified the numbers yet. Check this out. These numbers are now changing. Hugo and I are doing this deal together. This is in uh, in Midtown area, and when we bought it, we paid one twenty. When we bought this deal, we couldn't figure out why in the world is it priced at 120 when lots, comparable size lots, are going for $150,000, selling for $150,000, not listed, selling for $150,000. We couldn't figure it out. Why is it 120? Why is it 120? Put it under contract, tied it up, did some due diligence. Come to find out the realtor that had it listed 
didn't know what she had. She was a brand new realtor and screwed up. So we got a, we got a sweet deal on this one. Uh, the rehab, it was going to cost us 175. Now we're at 180, 180. It was going to be 130. Well, it's actually now it's even a little higher. It's, it's at one, 180. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to spend forty thousand dollars in costs, roughly. We'll be all in for about three thirty-five, maybe three fifty, something like that. But the ARV used to be four fifty. What's the ARV now? Say, say it real loud. Five twenty-five. Since we've owned this property, the value of this project has gone up $75,000. The reason it, the reason we've had this project so long is because we're going through the permitting phase. We're having some challenges down at the city, but I got the permits. Hopefully, we've got that all resolved, so our costs are going to be a little higher, but the ARV has gone up significantly. Okay, so our potential profit on this one was 125. Now it's going to be, now it's going to be even higher. How many square feet? 2,600 square feet. So you don't think it would have been better off the We yeah, we definitely considered that. Yeah, it's it's in an area of town where people love those old. Uh, yeah, it's kind of it's not it's not actually a historic district district, although right down the street, what three doors down is 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 some houses tagged for historic historical houses. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this next deal is up in Dallas. This is the first my first venture outside the Houston area, and um, I told you that I I use a lot of private money, right? And I, I'm a whiz at raising private money. And I thought, it'll be easy. I've got this deal up in Dallas. I'll just take some of my private money lenders with me up to Dallas. We'll do this deal. Everything will be hunky-dory. You'll see the numbers in a minute. It's a big deal. It takes a lot, of, a lot of money. So not all of my private money lenders had the financial wherewithal to take this deal down. And in single family, I like to use one lender for one house. So I have a limited number of private money lenders that could attack this, this size project. Because here's the numbers. Purchase for 310. It was listed on the MLS for 416. They dropped the price to uh, 360,000. We went in and bought it for three ten. Uh, we put we we figured one fifty. We ended up putting one sixty seven into it. So we're all in. Oh, we're just we spent about forty thousand in costs, roughly. Um, so we're all in for five seventeen. The ARV six fifty. Uh, Walnut Hill, who asked that question? I don't know. It's a, I've, I've been up there. I, you know, I don't know Dallas. It's Walnut Hill, where, wherever Walnut Hill is. You know, it's, that's the name of the subdivision and the and the and the property. Uh, so my profit potential on this one is one thirty three. Now it's on the market as we speak. Um, so you know we have to sell it for one or six fifty or more to make our one thirty uh, one thirty three. We've got it on the market right now at six ninety. It'll probably sell for around six seventy, something like that. Okay, so I hope I I hope I've given you some idea of how to do a rehab the kinds of money that can be made. But now I want to tell you the absolute most important thing you can do. You ready? The absolute most important thing, in fact, it is the key to success 
for rehabbing is to take action. Only when you take action can you succeed. Only when you, you every, every, every success story starts with a first step. And you folks are here today and you have the opportunity to take your first step and join us in Prosperity Group and, and, and come along with us and see the kinds of deals we're doing and participate in that and build your business uh, around the models that we offer. Uh, that's all I've got on the presentation. I've got five minutes. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I would like to know the other 39 ways to find money. <laughs> the other 39 ways to find motivated sellers or find money? To find motivated sellers. Okay, I'd like to know that. I'll tell you what. See me after. I'll give you my business card and uh, I will email you the list. Is that fair? Anybody else who wants it, come see me. All right, I'll tell you what, I'll go get a stack of business cards because I've only got 10 or 12 in my pocket. I'll go get a stack of business cards, email me, I'll send you all the list. Yes, sir. One general thing that you talked about earlier, you won't make a 10 when you said anybody wants, you won't make a 10 now. Uh -huh. I don't know whether you said that, but everybody wants it. Then it counts off. Yeah, granite countertops, um, stainless steel appliances. Yeah, that, that Westbury house, I put, a, I put a wine cooler in there. I put a wine room in there. Even under $100,000 home, they are expecting to Doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise me. Yes, ma'am. Her question is, after I put it on the market, how long did it take to sell? I don't know. That one took a little while. Um, I can't remember. I don't know. I move most of my houses pretty quickly. I, typically, I move a house in less than 30 days, generally. That one took a little longer. But I, I, can't, I couldn't tell you how. I'd have to go back and look. So more Any other? In that area, by the time you apply it, by the time you sell it, and it, about five months. Two. Yeah. I, she was... She asked me how long from the time I put it on the market did it sell. That's what I was yeah. That yeah. It's about right. Because it's a, you know, this is a fairly good sized job. Yeah. Uh, you, th you think that's a major rehab? Wait till, you see, wait till you see what we're doing to Andrews. Is that a major rehab or what? $180,000 worth of work. Any other questions? Okay, folks, thank you very much for your kind attention. We will take a...